I'm going to try to take you on a fairly high tempo, high energy, wake up sort of calisthenics exercise to learn all about the magical, wonderful world of Matrix. So, Matrix, um, first of all, who knows what it is already? Mm, interesting. About 50 50. I'm going to have to recalibrate from where I normally am, which is either zero or 100. Um, so, Matrix is an open source project. And what it does is to define an open network for secure, decentralized, real-time communication. People use it for interoperable chat, like IRC on steroids, or interoperable VoIP, like, I guess, SIP on steroids. Um, you could use it for open communication within VR and AR. You could use it as a general purpose pub sub data fabric for IoT or any other kind of real-time data. But the overall idea is that we've tried to build the missing real-time communication layer of the open web. Now, before some people say, oh my god, that's what ActivityPub is, you horrible people, why are you competing with ActivityPub? Uh, the reality is that we started this just before <laughs> ActivityPub and uh, focused much more on real-time, instant messaging style sort of pub-sub use cases rather than social media stuff. And it's very much inspired actually by a proprietary system we built before it, which was just a HTTP-based um, event bus where you could go and get an arbitrary URL, and it would block until there was some data available on that URL, and then other people would put or post to the same sort of URL taxonomy, and you had this really simple um, sort of um, uh, event bus, basically, for distributing data, and it was called Glow, and it inspired what ended up being Matrix. The founding principles of Matrix, however, is that it is decentralized. No single party should ever have control of your conversations. And conversations therefore get replicated over all participants. So this is a fundamental shift from obviously centralized communication services like Slack or Teams or whatever, um, or for that matter, centralized um, standards-based approaches like XMPP, Marx, or um, any kind of place where you have a single chat server that mediates the conversation. Matrix is very similar to Git, but for communication. So it looks like this. You have a mesh of servers in blue, um, which can be run by different people on different domains, written in different languages, um, talking to one another in a full mesh topology, typically. And then you have matrix clients which go and talk to these. And these could be um, chat clients like Element or um, um, something more exotic. And we have the client server API that imaginatively connects clients to servers, and you have the server server API that imaginatively connects servers to servers. Then you have a few other building blocks in the ecosystem. You have application services. So these things are clients um, with superpowers. They're clients with root. They can go and subscribe to any data on that server to do things like bridge it to a different platform, or pipe it into an LLM, or index it, or translate it into Portuguese, whatever you want. Then you have um, identity servers, which are very much still a stopgap way of looking up identifiers on Matrix based on an identifier like an email address or a phone number. So one um, configuration that you see out there on the public internet is that the application services are often used as bridges through to systems like IRC networks or XMPP network, could be going through to Telegram or Slack, Discord, WhatsApp, you name it. These things are actually quite easy to write. The um, architecture of the protocol is very asymmetrical in the clients are designed to be really stupid and simple, such that the first um, bridge we ever wrote, an IRC one, was about 20 lines of Perl, and then the Slack one is about 100 lines of JavaScript, because it's basically just turning the webhooks that you get on the Slack API into a standards-based flavor of webhooks that you then talk with the rest of Matrix. So you can use it as this kind of um, intermediary glue um, between all the other um, chat platforms there, although a lot of people just use it um, natively instead. So a quick uh, brief history of why on earth I'm standing here and why we built this. Um, the team's actually been together for 20 years, depressingly. We met at university and started off doing APIs around phone network connectivity. I specialized in VoIP and video calling, SIP, all that sort of thing. In 2010, we got acquired by Amdox, an Israeli telecoms vendor. And after a few years running their unified comms division, uh, we got a little bit frustrated with the state of the phone network. The fact that it is this closed cabal, the fact that the standards there like SIP are very much just a IP version of a phone line from 150 years ago. 
And the fact that RCS that was emerging at the time was one of the worst standards that we'd ever had to implement in order to try to get telcos to compete with WhatsApp. And we were frantically building these amazing um, sort of Skype or WhatsApp um, competitors, trying to get our customers, people like Telecom Italia and Singtel, to use them. And the telcos would say, no, this is not based on SIP and IMS and RCS. Even though it's a lot better, we can't possibly use this because it's not standardized in this manner. So we decided in 2013 to burn the phone network to the ground. And the flavor that we used for this was to just do a completely green field, blue sky, thought experiment of how do you define a protocol for real-time comms built for today's internet. Obviously, or at least the 2013 vintage of today's internet, obviously it would be HTTP APIs because everybody knows how to do that. Um, obviously, everything would be group communication. You wouldn't have this stupid one-to-one -one stuff, which in practice is pretty rare relative to people jumping on group calls and group chats. Um, it would have shared history by default. It would be decentralized, so you don't have uh, a Facebook or somebody emerging as a kind of spider in the middle of the web. And um, it would be end-to-end -end encrypted by necessity. Because if you decentralize something and you replicate data all over the place, then obviously you want it to be encrypted. So that was basically the idea of Matrix. And in September 2014, uh, we launched it after about six months of basically doing nothing but accumulating tech debt. We rushed frantically through getting something that vaguely worked out the door and literally spent the next five years paying off the six months of tech debt that we had accumulated. Um, we started to do the end-to-end -end encryption stuff in 2015 using Signal as the um, uh, implementation, effectively, or the design of the protocol. Um, then we really wanted to ship um, a flagship app because so many open source protocols and projects have failed due to not having a killer app. Now, if you look at XMPP or IRC, for that matter, or even SIP, there's never been the kind of Netscape Navigator gold equivalent or um, sort of something that normal people can put in their hands and play with. So we created an app um, originally called Vector, then renamed Riot, nowadays called Element, which we launched in 2016. In 2017, we spun out of Andox and created a startup now called Element um, to basically hire that core Matrix team, both to keep the lights on and to make sure there was a kind of flagship vendor for Matrix. Um, 2019, we finally got out of beta after only five years, um, launched Matrix 1.0 and also set up a nonprofit, Matrix.org Foundation, to protect Matrix from evil capitalists like Element. Um, we turned on end-to-end -end encryption eventually in 2020. This was hard. It turns out that decentralized encryption is a nightmare in terms of um, distributing keys reliably on a very Byzantine fault-tolerant network. And even today, um, people who use Matrix may be familiar that sometimes we don't get it quite right, although we are so close. And then today, uh, we launched or announced Matrix 2.0 a few weeks ago, which is a whole bunch of step changes on top of Matrix, as well as Element X, which is a new flagship client built to showcase that. So, a couple of stats. Um, over the last four or five years, you can see how our phone home telemetry of the reference um, Synapse Python implementation of Matrix has been going. So this goes and hits back optionally, of course, opt-in, um, with how many users are on a given server. It's been growing you know, relatively curvily, but probably somewhat linearly for the last um, few years, up to 114 million um, federated known users on the network. About half of those are um, bridged from other platforms, so they are accidentally using Matrix, whether they want to or not, because people on Matrix are talking to them. Um, another half, in turn, are guest users. So the sort of real, total, native, registered, signed up Matrix user audience is probably a quarter of that. In terms of monthly active users on the matrix.org server, you can see over the last couple of years, it's been going up in slightly unusual patterns, but still going up and to the right. Um, so who uses this thing? Um, Basically, it's a really weird mix of public sector and geeks. 
or in some instances, public sector geeks. So in Germany, you have got an app called BV Messenger or BW Messenger, which is the official messaging app for the German military that is a fork of Element um, that we um, build with them. That's being extended to Bundes Messenger that spans the whole German state. You've got CHAP, the equivalent for France. You've got the UN using it. And it turns out that they really like having self-sovereign, run-it-yourself comm systems where you're not dependent on putting everything unencrypted inside Teams or Slack or some other system. Um, lots of other governments, including the US, the UK, Sweden, Austria, Luxembourg, uh, Ukraine. Turns out that it's useful to have decentralized end-to-end um, -end -end encrypted communication if your infrastructure is being compromised. Um, NATO have um, taken to using it. Um, and then on the open source side, lots of projects, whether it's Mozilla, Gnome, KDE, blah, blah, blah. Um, also, the Linux Foundation has just um, got involved and is hoping to provide it as an offering to all of their um, people in their sort of environments, so the whole Kubernetes community, et cetera. And also, a pattern we've seen is folks in the SRE community, including some very big ones, um, using it as the disaster recovery system so that um, if your day-to-day -day Teams or Slack or Workspace or whatever it is goes bang or you can't trust it and you want to have a cryptographically verified decentralized thing where you have actually confirmed the identity of who, who you're talking to um, and you have multiple replicas all around your infrastructure, I would argue that Matrix is a really good fit. Now, we used to use, and in fact, we do still use ourselves, IRC, as the emergency out of band, oh my god, everything's on fire. Let's at least have something we know we can rely on situation. But interestingly, we had a catastrophic production incident in 2019, um, in the, just after um, splitting out um, and setting up Element, where our legacy infrastructure that ran the matrix.org server had grown very organically without a proper network perimeter, without a sensible security model. And unfortunately, um, it turned out that somebody hijacked an SSH session with um, SSH forwarding enabled in order to get some root eventually on basically all of the machines which were running the matrix.org instance. So we lost a data center as bad as it can possibly get. So obviously we had to burn it to the ground and completely rebuild it from scratch and try to flush the attacker out. And it was interesting because we did the entire disaster recovery of your worst possible disaster recovery situation via matrix. Obviously we couldn't use the matrix.org server, but everybody already ran their own personal ones or we had sort of separate ones or corporate ones. And it was a really interesting dog fooding experience of actually using it for this um, use case. Right, matrix in block diagram form. You got the spec which connects um, or defines the client server API which links the servers on the bottom to the clients on the top. You also have obviously um, four other APIs that connect servers to each other, do push, do identity, do application services, and I think that's it. And uh, Synapse is written in Python, it's our original implementation. Then we have Dendrite written in Go, which is our second gen one, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, you then have lots of bridges and services in green. On the client side, we started off doing completely separate stacks, very deliberately, to try to keep ourselves honest in terms of having um, uh, independent implementations that we were dog fooding the protocol rather than just having a monoculture. So we had a JavaScript and TypeScript and a React one for the web with Element Web as an app on top, one for iOS with Element iOS and one for Android in Kotlin and originally Java with Element Android on top. Then as we go to the right, we go into the future and we have Hydrogen, which is a very lightweight JavaScript SDK designed for embeddable matrix clients. And on top of that, we have Hydrogen itself, which is this really light, I think it's 75K of code, including its end-to-end -end encryption and JavaScript and HTML. So if you want to have an intercom style embed a little thing into a web page or run it as a progressive web app, that's your man. Um, Chatterbox, which is an embedded version of Hydrogen. Um, third Room, which I'll talk about a bit later, but it's um, a crazy 3D um, spatial collaboration matrix client. And then the next generation. And what we've done is to stop doing everything in triplicate and therefore tripling our dev costs and more than tripling our maintenance problems of keeping the guys on the left-hand side in sync. Instead, we very clichedly rewrote it in Rust 
and built a next generation sort of best practice flagship SDK in the form of Matrix Rust SDK. And that now also uses native Rust encryption, um, including our own implementation of the signal protocol um, called the Dozomats. And on top of that, you have a very lightweight native layer in SwiftUI or Jetpack Compose on iOS and Android. So the app itself there um, is basically sharing 95% of the heavy lifting in Matrix Rust SDK. All the green stuff is us as the matrix.org foundation. All the stuff along the top basically is element um, code, and then all the purple stuff is the rest of the world. And the wider matrix ecosystem is huge in terms of people building their own servers. There's a Rust implementation called Conduit. eJapadi from the XMPP community in Erlang just added matrix support. There's an Elixir one called Polyjuice, a C++ one called Construct. Um, and then on the client side, there are loads, like Mozilla Thunderbird has got native matrix built into it now. You've got GTK and Qt ones and command line ones. You've got a really good native one for the Apple Watch. Um, as I said, clients are quite easy to write, and so they're uh, easily hundreds now. They vary in quality, like any project, but there are at least, I guess, 10 fully functional, usable ones. And then people write bridges and bots and integrations like crazy. So here's a bit more of an interesting diagram. Don't normally show this one, but I thought that for a SRE audience, it might be more interesting. So if you've got the internet over on the right-hand side, and you might have public matrix deployments chatting to one another, you might have a big organization here with different zones or different offices, different sub-organizations. This could be a government or something. And the beauty of matrix is that you can go and obviously run a big geographically distributed um, network there with the content replicated over it. And you can use a border gateway, which um, the nice people at Element will sell you one, which will connect you through safely to the internet, acting as securing the network, the network perimeter and being basically an application layer gateway. And then within that, you might have bridges through to, I don't know, Skype for Business. Say that this thing is actually more um, uh, old school. You might have XMPP connectivity. You might put your own clients into there. And then you also have the ability to go over air gaps so again, this is not an open source thing. It's a commercial product from Element uh, where we've gone and built hardware-based cross-domain gateways so that if you have a production or a higher security, different classification network, and you want to get the people in the big lockdown building able to talk to the people on the internet, but you need to have incredibly hardcore data loss protection, um, then it is possible to basically benignly man in the middle the matrix traffic um, assuming, of course, that you've explicitly established trust with the gateway and the people on the other side in order to do a full protocol break, go and decrypt everything, run it through whatever it might be, um, a regex, or it could be an ICAP-style um, antivirus scanner, reassemble it and send it on its way. So in practice, some of the big, exciting governments um, look an awful lot like this. If you imagine the left-hand one is a country, the right-hand one are other countries or the internet, and then you've got people in big control buildings somewhere um, who are not on the internet for obvious reasons. So how did this happen? How did we design this thing? The talk is called Designing Matrix. Let's talk about how we designed it. Well, in May 2014, uh, we got into a little off-site in France because the team is half French, half British, at the time at least, and um, tried to think of an architecture. That photo is awful, so I tried to clean it up slightly here and it didn't really help. But this is literally me the day that we started designing Matrix saying, guys, right, what architecture are we going to have? Are we going to have a simple client talks to a single centralized home server is option one. Option two, we're going to have two home servers, but your room only lives on one home server and it becomes a single point of failure. On three, are we going to have a distributed sync nightmare where your rooms get replicated between the servers? On four, it was something else, and then there's a five at the top, which is a hybrid, I think, where you have a local home server, and then you have a kind of um, semi-trusted cabal of servers in the middle. Well, suffice it to say that, stupidly or otherwise, we pick option three, uh, the di distributed sync nightmare, and that's why we've ended up doing this active-active syncing um, decentralized system. So in Matrix, your rooms are di directed acyclic graphs. They are just like Git repositories. So conversation history is the first class citizen of Matrix. Matrix is not like SMTP or XMPP or a message passing system. It is really like Git in terms of replicating big bushy graphs of data from A to B, except rather than code commits and Git, 
we've got messages or other communication events in Matrix. Um, each room begins with an origin event called m.room.create. And the events are namespaced a bit like Java with reverse DNS, with m. being our special um, official specified um, namespace. Each event you send points to a preceding one. Each event includes a signature that covers the preceding ones, like a blockchain, but it isn't a blockchain. And then the events basically make up the timeline of the room. Some of them can also update key value state within that room, and we call them state events, such as the name of the room, who is in the room, its topic, and you can go wild and namespace, whatever you like. So in Unix, everything in a, is a file. In Matrix, everything is a room. And within the room, you basically have a timeline and you have key value events. And we have um, protocol agility that came quite late in the day, but eventually we got it in there. Nowadays, we're on version 11, and that specifies the actual semantics of how the room data gets replicated um, between other servers um, that can speak that version of the protocol. So practically speaking, um, it sort of looks like this. What I would do is to bust out of here briefly and discover I don't have a URL bar anymore. And... Um, go to, oh, where is it, matrix.org, and actually somewhere in here, um, I had a nice animation that you would hope would still be um, to hand. That's embarrassing because it used to be there. Uh, let me demonstrate Element to you, actually, which has, of course, run out of. Let me show you Element X, which is hopefully on the right account. Yes, it is. Right, so this is Element X, the next generation app, whilst uh, the horrible old Electron element launches in the background. And um, as I said, this is written in Rust under the hood. I'm in about 6,000 different chat rooms here. And the whole thing has been built for instant launch and instant sync, despite the fact that I'm, I've got access to about a million different users over these different rooms. And if I were to go into our matrix advocacy room here, and see, I'm trying to find the animation for the talk tomorrow. And I go and click on this. Then, haha, there's a link that I thought I had open, but didn't. And it's the same diagram that we were just looking at. I realize I'm jumping around a little bit here. But whilst I'm in here, um, it's worth noting that this is actually an iOS app, but running natively on Mac OS. But um, it's tiny in terms of footprint. It's dynamically loading in all of the um, history as well as um, the content of the rooms, and frankly, it knocks the um, electron-based, web-based um, apps into a cocked hat. So what I was trying to show you is basically this animation of what actually happens. The, if Alice here on Alice.com, and she has a matrix ID under the hood of at Alice colon Alice.com, or pronounced Alice on Alice.com, she sends a message, and that's literally the curl. It's an HTTP post with some JSON saying hello, and a message type of m.text, and an event type of m.room.message with an access token to alice.com. Then that server validates whether she can do that in her room, which she can, and it starts building up a graph of what's going on. Then that gets fanned out for mesh to the other servers, and the API for this is more chunky because it's gone and put some authorization headers on it. It's gone and put some signatures, some Curve T4519 signatures on it. Um, and then the other servers hopefully validate that and accept it as well. Um, and then, say, bot, uh, it gets sent out to the actual clients on the other servers. And the way they work is to do an HTTP get on slash sync that blocks until there's something to receive, and then it trundles down to the clients. So that's all Matrix is. Send a message, HTTP put, or post. Receive a message, HTTP get that blocks until there's something. You can obviously do better, um, but um, we try to keep the core API as simple and stupid as possible. So anybody with a bash script who wants to plonk a curl in to send themselves a message can do so. Um, you've got um, a graph then that builds up. And say that Charlie sends a message too. This is kind of interesting because we're now out of sync. Alice's copy of the room is not matching Bob's, it's not matching Charlie's. But what happens is a bit like, I don't know, a Cassandra-style split um, that needs to be resolved. Um, Bob's message gets found out, and you have a bifurcation in the graph, and then Charlie's uh, message gets found out, and hey, presto, everybody's now back in sync. So that's what happens in Matrix. Every time you send a message, you basically have a temporary net split that then gets resolved, and who knows whether message two or three came first. You're probably going to order it based on timestamps or something. And then if Alice sends a later message, causality-wise, she heals that bifurcation, and you get a beautiful diamond um, diagram emerging in all the servers. So that is what this was trying to show you. So 
the magic of Matrix, and it turns out the academically novel bit of it, um, from a Usenix perspective, is what we call state resolution. So every time we send a state event, I, a key value change to a room, we have to reconcile our copy of the room with everybody else's. And the way it works is that you have both the black arrows that show the causality of the events in a room, but you also have the red arrows, so to speak, which um, show you the um, off DAG, basically the justification of why you're allowed to do things. So if Bob joins a room here, um, he will say, well, OK, the last message in the room was that I got invited by Carol, um, or that Carol got invited. However, the reason I can join is because I was invited by Bob, and because the join rules allowed me to be invited. And those join rules were sent by Alice, and she created the room. So every single time anything happens in Matrix, people basically provide a proof that justifies why they can do the access control, uh, well, why the access controls allow them to do the thing that they can do. And all the other servers will then go and compare that proof with what they know about the room. And if they agree that Alice was allowed to do that thing, or Bob was allowed to do that thing in this instance, then it's all great. And if they weren't allowed to do it, they will just ignore the event. Now, it turns out that um, nobody apparently had done decentralized access control like this without having a horrible blockchain or some kind of global lock in there. Whereas here, there is no finality. There is no blockchain. There's no global lock. Instead, it's basically everybody incrementally justifying why they can do the next operation. And if there is a literal physical net split, and I know Bob and Charlie on their server keep going off doing their own thing, that's fine. And you can have a net split that can legitimately last for hours or days, which is kind of useful in a network, uh, in a disaster recovery situation, or if you're in bad network connectivity because you're, I don't know, public sector defense, or if you're in space, or whatever it might happen to be. And um, so it kind of grows, just like Git grows without any um, lock across the overall data structure. And some guys at the University of Culture got very excited about this and wrote a bunch of papers about it. So already spoken about the APIs. Um, I'll skip this other than to point out that the server server API, this is a real one I grabbed off my home server last night, is relatively chunky in that you've got the hashes of the events as their IDs that form the auth structure, and you have signatures put on by the server and a bunch of other metadata. But in the end, it's basically decorating hello world. Now, the matrix spec evolves via a pretty um, mature open governance process now called the matrix spec process. Um, I won't bore you going through the whole flow chart, but basically it's a bit like um, the Rust um, uh, proposal process, RFC process, where somebody makes a proposal, anybody can do it. The core team review it. They propose either that it gets merged or ditched, and then it gets implemented. And you can see it since 2018 that we're up to, well, as of at least February of this year, we got up to about 700 of these, and roughly 50-50 split between ones which are yet to be dealt with and ones which have either been merged or closed, which I think is basically a feature, because some of these are really big. It's things like peer-to-peer -peer matrix, or account portability in matrix, or multi-homing in matrix, or entirely new end-to-end -end encryption. So some of these drag on for years, but it's very much a feature rather than a bug. Um, that is uh, a more detailed view of the logistics on it. It turns out that getting this right is surprisingly hard because it's very similar to evolving HTML and CSS, and you get into the hell of vendor prefixes where somebody creates a funky technology like Flexbox or the Matrix equivalent, they start shipping it in their browsers and it becomes a de facto standard, and then how the hell do you get rid of the vendor prefixes and make it official? So there's a lot of time that we spend in the spec core team trying to organize that process and kill off um, the legacy stuff. Um, some folks may be thinking, oh, Matrix, I hate it. How does this compare with XMPP? Um, XMPP has obviously been doing a similar thing for years. We design Matrix to do almost everything opposite. No, there is a single spec in Matrix. There isn't a cloud of zaps. The proposals I was talking about earlier are just diffs against that single spec. Um, different primitives. Matrix is about conversation history, not message passing. Everything is a group conversation. There are no DMs or one-on-ones in Matrix. It's just a room of two people in it. End-to-end um, -end encryption by default as a first-class citizen. Horrible HTTP and JSON, which is inefficient, but at least everybody can speak it. But we do support better transports. And also much more of a focus on bridging and defragmentation, hence the name Matrix, because we matrix everything together. So home server evolution. And I'm sorry for going fast, but I've got loads to go through here. <laughs> 
it started off looking like this. You have clients on the left, servers on the top right, and a big monolithic Python single core thing with a global interpreter lock in the middle with a Postgres cluster or SQLite for storage. Simple, horrible, because obviously you run out of CPU on the core and the global interpreter lock kicks in and it all falls over. Therefore, we split out um, worker processes in order to do things like send messages to clients or send push to clients or create events sent from clients and likewise on the server facing federation sender and re reader side. And this improved things a lot. However, you'll see that whilst everything's reading from the database, um, the writing is all happening from the main synapse process in the middle. And we were using HTTP APIs to basically um, replicate data from that main process and farm it out and split out Python modules to the other workers. And this, for its sins, is all written in Twisted, uh, which we picked, I picked, as a boring, stable technology back in 2013, which now in 2023 is a really boring, stable technology. And we perhaps regret it in some ways, but it has served us relatively well. Next thing we did was to switch to using Redis um, as an event bus to connect the workers together. So the main process is still the only writer to the database cluster here, but at least um, the wake ups and the fan out is happening over Redis, which is much better designed than horrible DIY HTTP APIs. Then we did the big thing of move the database writer off the main process, which is getting interesting now because the main process is increasingly just coordination, going and occasionally waking up Redis, and say the event creators and the federation receivers are now going and um, directly writing down into that worker process. However, we promptly ran out of CPU on the worker process, so the obvious thing that we did was to shard the writers. And that's the architecture that um, a big matrix deployment uses today, with basically all of the workers horizontally scaling, you do have a single synapse process, but it doesn't do very much. It does basically housekeeping. You still have a single database writer, but you can do fun stuff with Postgres to make that scale. And in practice, this works relatively well. In terms of Python runtimes, it's a pretty typical journey for anybody who's admin Python at scale. Started off with 2.7, added in jmalloc that helped a lot, played with PyPy that didn't help very much for our workload, shifted to Python 3, had to rewrite everything to get Twisted to support it. Then we ended up moving to Piston for a couple of years, which worked really well for us until Python 3.11 came along, which, as I'm sure people know, improved things massively. And right now, I think we're just using vanilla Python 3.11, with the exception that we've started to use more and more Rust um, to FFI the hot paths over. And the result is uh, on a big server like matrix.org, you've got a couple of hundred thousand simultaneous users connected. You've got about 50 messages a second coming in, but probably about 5,000 a second going out. Federates with at least 20,000 other servers. And this is the stats on one of the workers. I think it's the, master, uh, the main process. And um, you can see that, I mean, it's not amazing. It's around 200 mils um, for a message to go all the way through the pipeline. And CPU is between 50 and 100%. But the memory on that main process is hovering around a couple of gigabytes, which for a couple of hundred thousand clients doing some fairly chunky operations isn't so bad. Meanwhile, on Dendrite, our second generation server written in Go, we started with this amazing microservices architecture called the Go Polylift, where you've got everything horizontally scaling, no main process, everything has its own database, which can scale as horizontally as you like, and it is the platonic ideal of a event bus based um, uh, matrix server, originally using Kafka, subsequently using NATS. The only problem is that all of the people paying the bills and deploying Matrix at scale had already gone and rolled out Synapse. And we found ourselves frantically trying to make Synapse not suck for the benefit of France and Germany and all the others. So actually, the worker architecture was very inspired by what, um, Dendrite, uh, what we discovered was doing Dendrite. So completely perversely, the Dendrite code base, as of 2023, has ended up becoming a monolith. So what we have is um, a whole bunch of uh, well, the same microservices inside a single binary sharing the same database. And what we do is to use Dendrite nowadays for experimentation for peer-to-peer -peer matrix. Um, embedded servers because it's a very efficient small footprint server, despite the fact it could scale horizontally. Right, I'm running out of time. Um, our philosophy has been make it work, make it work right, and then finally make it work fast. Make it work fast has really been happening this year, where we took our old um, architecture that I mentioned earlier and then switched it to Element X with the Rust core 
SwiftUI and Jetpack Compose on top, and then this new entity called a sliding sync proxy, which effectively gives a entirely new API surface exposed by the Synapse, the home server on the right-hand side, such that only the data you care about gets synced to the client. And that's what I show, showed you in my accidental demo earlier, where I launched Element X and it came straight up because it was only lazy loading the stuff that you need. It outperforms Telegram or WhatsApp or iMessage or Slack or Discord, et cetera, in terms of being able to pull in huge amounts of data on demand. I could bore you with the API, but basically the whole idea is that performance is always 01, no matter how many rooms that you're in. And it was heavily inspired by the Discord API under the hood. Rust SDK also mentioned it a lot. Um, uh, we had to implement the async bindings for Rust with UniFFI to make it work. So if you're or any of your developers are in the business of wanting to do really efficient multi-platform native development, I highly recommend this stack now. Um, comparison with SIP, um, probably uh, basically we go multi in a way that SIP is all about one-to-one -one calling. And what we've done is to actually add native end-to-end -end encrypted multi-party VoIP into Matrix. Element Call is the main app using this, but we're also now embedding it into Element X. Um, if you're interested in a completely new video conferencing code base using Matrix under the hood for all the signaling and all the encryption, then go and give call.element.io a go. It also um, has potential, but it's not implemented yet, to cascade across Matrix. So you end up with multiple conferencing servers which replicate stuff together, a bit like the topology of how Matrix um, servers replicate data. So you can have this Byzantine fault-tolerant mesh of conferencing servers conferencing together the local people with different implementations going and basically making the VoIP work. Matrix 2.0, we announced a few weeks ago. It's not yet a spec release, but it basically takes these new bits, native VoIP, sliding sync, the next generation sync API, also native OpenID Connect for Roth and much faster joins, and that's enough of a step change to deserve a major version bump, so we've called it Matrix 2.0, and we released it in Element X um, a few weeks ago on September the 21st. So what else is going on? I've got three minutes, 14 seconds. Digital Markets Act. Who knows about the Digital Markets Act? Surprisingly few people. This is going to change everything. This is regulation from the EU obligating the big tech companies to interoperate together for messaging solutions. So we already provide a messaging protocol. It's probably not coincidence that the EU saw Matrix and thought, huh, it can be done. So this requires people to, whilst maintaining end-to-end -end encryption, interoperate. You either do it using open APIs or you converge on a common protocol. We actually ended up working with Google to bridge Android messages into Matrix to demonstrate this complete with end-to-end -end encryption. And meanwhile, in the ITF, we participate in a working group called Mimi that is um, targeting this common protocol approach. And we're basically proposing Matrix into ITF to provide many of the layers of this instant messaging interoperability play so that um, Android messages can go and talk to WhatsApp, can talk to iMessage, can talk to whatever other large players there are there, which could change everything and literally could burn the phone network to the ground as we originally intended, because why do you need a phone network if all the messaging apps that people actually use today are forming a big meta network, some kind of matrix? Um, cross domain gateways, I already mentioned them, skip that. Secure border gateways, similar, but some software, and they don't man in the middle of the encryption. They are just for metadata. I mentioned them as well. Um, a whole bunch of other products you can buy from the lovely people at Element that allows us to keep developing matrix, um, like a Kubernetes operator-based enterprise distribution that packages up all of the HA and Elastic scaling and or, or a whole bunch of other um, commercial bolt-ons. Other stuff going on, account portability. Um, it's a big thing missing that things like Blue Sky has, and we're adding it in. And then we've got three things which are really cool, but currently on hold. One of them is peer-to-peer -peer matrix, and this is how we use Dendrite these days, in that we just put Dendrite inside the app. So no more servers. You have a mesh network over AirDrop or Bluetooth Low Energy um, using an overlay network we created called Pinecone, and that allows the client to just talk to a server on localhost, and then that replicates appropriately. Another one is ultra-low bandwidth. I'm going to try doing a really quick last-minute demo um, because this is really, really cool, and you guys will appreciate it, I hope, if I can find the right thing. Um, so this is um, uh, um, uh, um, something I wrote which uses your local um, Docker, um, if I actually found out the right environment. Uh, bah, 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 bah. So, 
Uh, yeah, right. No, get the right port. So here um, I can start clicking around. Every time I click, you can see my CPU is going mad. It's going and instantiating a matrix server, and it's using traffic shaping inside the Linux kernel that is used for Docker under the hood or whatever they use nowadays on Mac OS. And you can see that you actually have this mesh of servers here. You can move them around, and if I zoom in, you can see that it has different latencies and um, uh, bandwidths between these servers. So you're literally creating a mesh network of real servers running locally. And if I spin up a, um, uh, an instance of um, Element, it has to be a slightly old version here. Come on, you can do it. Um, if it's not already logged in, surely the Wi-Fi should be good here. I'm almost out of time. Um, there we go. So this is what a typical Element web looks like. It's trying to log into matrix.org. I'm going to tell it to just log in on localhost to port 18,000, which will be server zero here and log in as Matthew and Secret. And here I am literally now talking inside that server. Now, if I go and um, find a quick script um, and make a chat room in there, then it's created one called hash test on Synapse Nort. I'm going to um, join another six, and I will stop any second now. This is literally 10 seconds left. And you can see the actual matrix traffic you can visualize in real time as the things inside my Docker uh, going and sending traffic around the place. Such so in this room, if I say, hello world, pew, you can see the message fly around the network of the other servers going on here. So um, in here, you can then dial down the bandwidth to like 100 bits per second and see um, send a bunch of messages in because it's fun, or I can do a full mesh um, message. Basically, um, it allows us to um, play around with this. And my very final thing is finally Third Room, which is the 3D matrix client, which tragically is not being developed at the moment, but is really, really cool in terms of having a spatial metaverse style thing with um, underpinned by matrix. We need help. Don't use proprietary chat systems. Please um, commercially support Matrix either by donating to the foundation or buying something from Element. And thank you very much. Whew.